Hey, welcome back everybody. Jeff Frick here with theCUBE. We're in our Palo Alto studios for a CUBE conversation. We're talking about startups today, which we don't often get to do, but it's really one of the more exciting things that we get to do, because that's what really what keeps Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley. And this next new company is playing on a very hot space, which is Edge. You're all about cloud. The next big move is Edge, especially with Internet of Things and Industrial Internet of Things. And so we're really happy to welcome Edgeworks here, fresh off the, the announcement of the new company and their funding. We got the both founders, we have Farah, Papa Yu Anu, and mm -hmm. she is the president, and uh, Kilden Hopkins, the CEO, both of Edgeworks. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks. So Thanks for, for those us. of us uh, that aren't familiar, give us kind of the quick 101 on Edgeworks. So I've been looking at the space, I was a venture capitalist before I joined uh, up with Kilton, um, and I've been looking at edge computing for a long time because it just made intuitive sense to me. Um, you're looking at all these devices that are now not just devices, but they're compute platforms or, you know, generating all this data. Well, how are we going to address all that data if you think about sending all that back to the cloud latency, bandwidth, and cost. Um, you talk about breaking the internet, this is what's going to break the internet, not Kim Kardashian's you know, butt photo, right? So um, how do you solve that problem? You know, If you think about autonomous vehicles, for example, these are now computer on wheels. They're not just a transportation mechanism. If they're generating all this data and they need to interact with each other and make decisions in near real time, how are they going to do that if they have to send all that data back to the cloud? Right, so right. that's where I came across a Kilton's company, or the, actually the technology that he built and we formed a company together uh, I looked at everything and the technology that he developed was far leaps and bounds beyond anything anyone else had come to to date, so. So Kilton, how did you start on that project? Yeah, so this actually goes way back. This goes way back to like about 2010. Um, back in Chicago was looking at what architecture is going to allow us to do the types of processing that's really expensive and do it closer to where the data is. So architecture was in the back of my mind. When I came to the Bay Area, I uh, jumped in with the city of San Francisco as an IOT advisor and everywhere I looked I saw the same problems. Nobody was doing secure processing at the edge in any kind of way that was manageable. So I started to solve it. Then years later after doing, you know, I did some deployments myself and after seeing how was this stuff working, had finally arrived at an architecture that I thought, okay, this thing's passing all of these trials and now I think we've got this, this pretty well nailed. So um, I basically got into it before the terms fog and edge computing were being thrown around and so I said, this is what has to happen. Right. And then uh, of course uh, it turns out that the world catches up and now of course there's terms for it and everyone's talking about the edge. So it's, it's, it's an interesting problem, right? It's the same old problem that we've been having forever, which is do you move the data to the compute or do you move the compute to the data? And then we've had these other things happening with suddenly this you know, huge swell of, of, of data flow and that's mm -hmm. even before we start you know, kind of the IoT uh, connection on the data flow. Luckily, uh, networks are getting faster, 5G's mm -hmm. just around the corner, chips are getting faster and cheaper, and memory's getting cheaper and faster, and then we had the, the development of the cloud and really the, mm -hmm. the, the hyper growth of the public cloud. But that doesn't that still doesn't help you with kind of these low latency applications that you have yeah. to execute on the edge. And and obviously we talk to GE a lot and you know everyone loves to talk about turbines and and you know how and the harsh conditions and you know mm -hmm. nasty weather and it's not this pristine data center, how do you put compute and how much compute do you put at the edge and how do you manage kind of that data flow? What what can you deal with there? What do you have to send up? And then of course you know, this pesky thing called physics and latency, which, mm -hmm. which just prohibits, as you said, the ability to get stuff up to some compute and get it back in time necessarily to do something about it. So what is the approach you guys are taking? What's a little bit different about what you've built with Edgeworks? Sure. So in most cases, people think about the edge as like almost a lead into the cloud. They say, how can I pre-process the data, maybe curtail some of the bandwidth volume that I need in order to send data up to the cloud? But that doesn't actually solve the problem. You'll never get rid of cloud latency if you're sending just smaller packages. And in addition, you have n done nothing to address the security issues of the edge if you're just trying to package data, maybe reduce it a bit and send it to the cloud. So what's different about us is, with us, you can use the cloud, but you don't have to. We're completely at the edge. So you can run software with Edgeworks that stays within the four walls of a factory if you so choose, and no data will ever leave the building. And that is a stark difference from the approaches that have been taken to date, which have been tied to the cloud, but we do a little at the edge. It's like, come on, this is real edge. Right, right. And so is it a, it's a software layer that sits on top of whatever kind of the BIOS and firmware are on, on a lot of these dump sensors, is that kind of the idea? Yeah, no, actually it sits, uh, exactly, it sits above the BIOS level, but it sits above the firmware. 
Um, it, allow, it creates a, uh, an application runtime, so it allows developers to write applications um, that are containerized, so we run containers at the edge, uh, which allows uh, our developers to run uh, applications they've already developed for the cloud, to write new applications, but they don't have to learn an entirely new framework or an entirely new SDK. They can write using tools that they already know, Java, C Sharp, C++, Python. If you can write that language, we can mm -hmm. run it in, at the edge, right. which again allows people to uh, use skill sets that they already know. They don't have to like learn specialized skill sets for the edge. Why should they have to do that? You know. Right. I think, it, and, and uh, you know, good for you guys to get Stacy Hagenbotham to write a nice article about the company long before you launch, which is which is good. Um, but I thought she had a really interesting breakdown on kind of edge computing, and, and she broke it down into four layers. The device, the sensor, as you, as you said, as dumb as it can be, mm -hmm. right? You want a lot of these things. Um, then this gateway layer that collects the data, mm -hmm. you know, some level of compute close to the edge, yeah. um, not necessarily in the camera or in any of these sensors, mm -hmm. but close. And then of course, a connection back to the cloud. So you guys run in the in the sensor, or probably more likely in that gateway layer, or, or do you see in, in some of the early customers you're talking to, are they putting this like little micro data centers? I mean, how, how are you actually seeing the stuff deployed in the field at scale? Mm -hmm. So we actually gave Stacy that uh, four layer chart because yeah. we were trying to explain people to the edge, uh, to the people who didn't understand what there was. And again, people refer to all these different layers at, at the edge. We actually think that the layer right above the, the sensors is actually the most difficult mm -hmm. to solve for. And the reason why we don't want to run on the sensor level is because sensors are becoming more and more commoditized. A customer would rather have a thousand dumb sensors where they could get more and more data than have like 10 really, really smart sensors where they could run compute on them. So um, unless there are spe spe special circumstances, like in the case of a camera where we're actually working with a camera that has GPU capability where they could actually run on the edge, we'd like to l run at a le level up there. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, one is, if you run on the devices itself, you can't really aggregate each other's devices. You can't aggregate, a temperature sensor cannot aggregate a pressure sensor's data. You need to set up the layer above. Also, we're able to serve as a broker between low levels of you know, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth versus you know, high levels of TCP IP, right? which you also cannot do at the um, sensor level. If you were to run at the sensor, you basically have to do what Amazon does, which is device to cloud, which doesn't really afford you the capability of running real software at the edge. Right. So when, when you're out, let's just say the camera, we talked a little bit before we turn the cameras on about the surveillance um, and surveillance cameras. I mean, where are those gateways and, and, and you know, where's the power and the connectivity uh, to that gateway? What do, you, what do you see in some of these early yeah. examples? So, you know, for cameras, you've got basically two choices. Either the camera is a dumb camera that puts a video feed to some kind of a compute box that's nearby or is on a wired network or wireless network that's, that's you know, private to it. So, uh, in building cameras that are already in place that are analog, you can put a box in the building that can take the feeds. But the better option than that even is to have smart cameras. So probably new Greenfield Deploy would have smart cameras that have the ability to do the AI uh, processing right there in the, in the module. So the answer is um, somewhere you have a feed of sensor data, whether it be video, audio, or just like a temperature you know, time series data, and then it hits a point of where you're still on the edge but you can do compute. Sometimes they're in the same unit, sometimes they're a little spread out, sometimes they're over wireless. That first layer up is where we sit no matter how the compute is done. Okay. And I'm just curious on some of the, the early use cases, um, how do people see the opportunity now to have kind of a software-driven IoT device that's separate from the actual firmware in the, in the sensor? I mean, what is that going to enable them to do that they're excited to do that they could do before? Yeah, so if you think about the, the older model, it's how can I make this device get its sensor readings and somehow communicate that data, and I'm going to write low-level code, probably C code or whatever to operate that, and is how often do I pull the sensor? And You're really thinking about just, geez, I just need to get this data somewhere to make it usable. And when you use us, you think, okay, I have streams of data, what would I do if I wanted to run software right where the data is? I can increase my sampling frequency. I can um, do everything we are going to do in the cloud, but do it right there for free once it's deployed. There's no bandwidth cost. So it opens the world of, of thinking of we're now running software at the edge instead of running firmware so I can just move the data upstream. You stop moving the data and you start moving the applications. And that's what's like the world changer for everybody. Right, right. Plus you can use the same skill sets you have for the cloud. And up until now, programming IoT devices has been a matter of saying, oh, you know, if I know how to work with the GPIO pins, you know, and you know, I can write in C, maybe I can make it work. And now you say, I know Python, and I know how to do data analytics with Python. 
I can just move that into the sensor module if it's smart enough or the gateway right there and I can pretty much push my code into the factory instead of waiting for the factory to wire the data to me. Yeah. We actually have a customer right now that's doing uh, real-time surveillance at the edge uh, and they have smart city deployments and they're looking at an uh, example of border control for example. Mm -hmm. uh, and what they want to be able to do is put these cameras out there and say, well, I've detected something on the maritime border here. Is it a whale? Is it debris? Or is it a boat full of refugees? Or is it a boat full of like pirates? Or is it a boat full of migrants? Well, before what they would have to do is, okay, well, as an edge device, maybe at, at the basic level of you know, processing I could run is to say, let me compress that video data and send some of it back, right? And uh, then do the analysis back there. Well, that's not really going to be that helpful because if I have to send it back to some cloud and do some anal analysis, by the time I recognize what's out there, too late. Right. What we can do now with our software capability, because we have our platform running on these cameras, is we can deploy software that says, okay, well I can detect right there, right at the edge, what is what we're seeing, and I can not just send back video data, which I don't really want to do, that's really you know heavy on bandwidth latency cost as well, is I can just send back uh, text data and say, well, I've actually detected something, so let's do some take some sort of action on it and say, okay, the next camera should be able to detect it or pick it up or send some notification that we need to address it back here. If I'm sending textual data back because I've already done that processing right there and then, I can run thousands of cameras out there at the edge versus just 10 or, you know, 10 or 12 because of the amount of cost and latency. Um, and then the, you know, the customer can decide, well, you know what, I want to add another application uh, that you know, does target tracking of you know, certain individual terrorists, right? Okay, well, it's easy for me to deploy that software because our platform's already running. Uh, we can, you know, and, and just push it out there at the edge. Oh, you know what, I, I'm able to model train at the edge and I can actually do better detection. I can go from 80% to 90%. Well, I can just push that data and do an upgrade right there at the edge as opposed to going out there and flashing that board and you know, uh, upgrading that way or sending out some sort of firmware upgrade. So it allows a lot of flexibility that we couldn't do before. Right. Well, I was going to ask you, now you got a, a, a pile of money, which is exciting and congratulations. Yep. Thank um, you. I was going to say, kind of, where are you going to focus on your go-to-market? You know, within a, any particular vertical or any specific horizontal application. But it sounds like I think we've used cameras now three or four times in the last three or four questions. So I'm guessing that's a that's a good, it's been you know, a kind of early early adopter mm -hmm. market for it, you guys. That one's been a strong one for us. Yeah, um, we've had some real success with telcos. Uh, another use case that uh, we've seen some real good traction is being able to detect quality of service issues at, on Wi-Fi routers. So uh, that's one uh, that we're looking at as well that's had some adoption. Uh, oil and gas has been pretty strong for us as well. So it seems to be quite of a horizontal play for us and we're excited about the opportunity. All right, well thanks for, uh, for coming on and telling the story and congratulations on your funding and launching the company and, Thank you. Uh, and bringing it to reality. Great, All yeah, right. thanks. Kilton, Farah, I'm Jeff, you're watching theCUBE. Thanks for watching, we'll see you next time. <laughs>